the growing fascination of there being life outside of our own planet is definitely running in the minds of many, and there are also countless individuals who wonder if those life forms from said distant planets wonder the same thing that we do. However, what enacted this large obsession on a worldwide scale as it is today? Well, although countless UFOs and USOs have been sighted throughout the world since the early ages of man, it was in 1947 when the world had its first and second extremely well-documented events that caused much widespread speculation about the idea of aliens being in the midst of our planet. Maury Island On June 21, 1947, Captain Harold Dahl, who worked as a harbor patrolman officer in Maury Island, which is about six miles west of Des Moines, Washington, was on patrol with his two rookies, his son and his dog. However, this was no ordinary day out in the sea, for when Dahl gazed up into the sky from his patrol boat, he saw six aircrafts floating around 2,000 feet above his watercraft. The objects were reported by Dahl and his crew to be made of a reflective material and were in the shapes of flat donuts about 100 feet in diameter. The center holes located on each craft were noted to be about 25 feet in diameter, and more circular objects were located along the sides of the aircrafts, which were determined by Dahl and his crew to be observation windows. Soon, Dahl and his fellow crewmen noticed that five of the UFOs circled over the sixth, and the sixth itself was lowering towards the patrol boat. This caused immense panic in most of the crew because they all thought that the aircraft was going to collide with their patrol boat, so not wanting to be sent to a watery grave, the crew hightailed it toward the shore. Upon reaching the shore, Dahl retrieved his binoculars in order to spot the bizarre aircraft from the shore, and he also grabbed his camera to take photos as evidence that he spotted the strange aircraft. While taking the pictures, the lower craft stayed in a still position, while the five others circled around it for about five minutes, before the lower aircraft suddenly dropped down but stopped abruptly at about 500 feet above the water. One of the five ships circling around the lower ship came down to meet it. The two crafts stayed in this position for several minutes, until eventually Dahl thought that he heard a thump. Instantaneously, more thumps followed to which Dahl, using his binoculars, saw that the middle aircraft was now dropping what Dahl suspected to be newspapers from the inside of its center hole as it swiftly approached his watercraft. When the aircraft got close enough, it was discovered that the objects weren't newspapers, but instead white, lightweight metals and black lava-like rocks. Dahl even stated that when the lava-like rocks landed into the sea, it caused the water to steam. With these dangerous pieces of debris falling ever closer to their boat, the crew sought cover below deck. However, not before one of the materials struck Dahl's dog, killing it in the process, and another one wounding his son in the arm. Dahl even tried to radio for assistance, but the transmitter wasn't functioning. Even though his radio was out of action and no help was on the way, most of the debris splashed into the water. Soon after the raining of metals and rocks, the airships rose up high into the sky and zoomed westward together. The crew then exited the lower deck and examined the boat for any damage. Luckily for the crew, the boat was hardly damaged and they set sail back to their dock, and in the process, lowering the dog over the side and into the water in the form of a burial at sea. Upon docking, Dahl took his son to the hospital so that his wounds could be treated and afterwards explain the incident to his boss. Fred Chrisman, who didn't believe Dahl because when the photos Dahl took of his patrol were printed and examined, the strange airships Dahl informed him of and showed him in the now developed photos were compared and believed to be film noise and damage caused by radiation. Not wanting to shy away from proving the incident's authenticity, Dahl returned to Maury Island to collect rock samples in hopes of finding the ones dropped from the middle aircraft that he had encountered during the incident. Dahl reported that while he did this, he spotted one of the aircrafts hovering above him as if it were spying on him. He eventually gathered the rocks and was preparing to show them to his boss the next day, but when that day came, he was visited by a small, pale man in a black suit. 
The man suggested that the pair of them should get breakfast together, to which Dahl agreed, so he followed the stranger to a restaurant. While they ate breakfast together, the strange man asked no questions, but instead gave a descriptive account about what Dahl had witnessed the previous day, and eventually warned Dahl that bad things would happen to not only him, but his entire family should he continue with the investigation or tell anyone about the now famous incident. However, this did not change Dahl's mind about the incident and he showed Chrisman the fragments of metal he found in the rock samples he had taken, to which Chrisman then acknowledged that Dahl had been telling the truth. So the pair of them sent a package to publisher Ray Palmer in Chicago, who later founded Fate magazine. The contents inside the package were the metal fragments and statements about the strange incidents and findings on the 21st and 22nd of June. A noteworthy incident that we continue to discuss and debate amongst ourselves to this day. Yet not even a month later would another incident occur that is possibly the most well-known and talked about alien encounter in history. Roswell On July 8, 1947, in the small town of Roswell, New Mexico, there were reports of a flying disc that crashed into the desert not far from the Walker Air Base that made front headlines around the world. The reports noted that bodies of aliens had been retrieved from the crash site and were hauled to the infamous Area 51 Air Base in the Nevada desert where autopsies were performed and carried out. Shortly afterwards, a press release by high military authorities stated that rumors of a flying saucer had become something of a reality and that an intelligence officer at the Roswell Army Airfield was fortunate enough to gain and hold possession of one of the saucers. This statement sent newspaper reports of the incident around the world insane, and news headlines of this Roswell flying saucer was everywhere. However, just 24 hours later, that high military authority changed their story, stating that they had made a mistake and that flying saucer was actually in fact a weather balloon. Unbelievably, the public appeared to have accepted this explanation, and very little was said about the Roswell incident for many years afterwards. It wasn't until the late 1970s when some military personnel involved began to speak out about what happened all those years ago, and ufologists as well as conspiracy theorists' thoughts went into overdrive, thus developing the Roswell case in instant as we know it today. One of the first military personnel to speak out about the Roswell UFO incident was Major Jesse Marcel. He was one of the two military personnel sent to investigate the crash site. The other one, who was with Major Jesse Marcel, was Sheridan Cavett, who had always claimed that he wasn't even there. Major Jesse Marcel described how large amounts of metallic debris were scattered all over the area, so the craft had obviously hit the ground at a high speed. He stated that it was clearly not a weather balloon, aircraft, or missile because he recovered fragments from the crash and described seeing hieroglyphic types of writing painted on it. The metal was also reported by him to be light, thin as paper, but incredibly strong and hard, which was unlike anything he had ever seen in his career and life before. He also helps answer the question as to where the fragments were taken by simply saying, not only did they just have the one I analyzed, but others as well, to which are being kept well preserved in the military installation somewhere. Marcel's story doesn't end there, however, because later in life, he told his expanding family about his investigation at Roswell. According to his grandson, my grandfather Marcel would privately share details of his experiences with the entire family and when I was a kid, basically around the dinner table. He told us how he was the head of intelligence and lead investigator of the 509 bombing group. He would talk about it with people continuously, asking a multitude of questions about the Roswell UFO incident. The National Security Agency published a report in 1994, a staggering 47 years after the initial incident, which stated that the alien bodies supposedly recovered from the crash site were in fact just life-size test dummies. Many saw this as the government just trying to dig itself out and cover up the situation, which only continued to fuel conspiracy theories. Lots of more witnesses came forward and spoke out about the Roswell UFO incident, including a photographer who claims that he was asked if he could photograph the crash site. 
He explained how he was asked to take photos of the inside of a dark tinted area and this is where he observed four identical bodies with humongous heads and shadowy skin. After taking the pictures, he was debriefed and ordered to forget everything he noticed at the crash site, but then a witness more credible than everybody else combined spoke out, just before he passed away in 2005. His name was Lieutenant Walter Hott, the man who published and released the original weather balloon report back in 1947. Before his passing, he wrote and left a sworn affidavit. In it, he claimed that the weather balloon story was a cover-up for the UFO that had been successfully recovered from the crash site, and he also confirmed that he had seen dead alien bodies in this still widely debated Roswell UFO incident. With these two incidents raising so much speculations and questions, one might ask if we will ever know what went on. However, as the years fly by and as the people who were involved or witnessed these incidents pass away, we are really only drifting further away from the inevitable answer. So until the government sheds light on this mystery or the next incident does that for us, we can only continuously marvel at the fact that these two instances combined have been not only the gateway to extraterrestrial debates as we know them today, but also might just be the biggest government cover-ups in history regarding human contact with alien and otherworldly beings. Though these two events are the most widely renowned encounters with extraterrestrials, thousands of encounters have been reported throughout the world to present day. These next 15 stories are only a sample of this ever-unfolding phenomena. I never told anyone this story because I never thought they would believe me. I was home alone one evening and had gone to sleep for the night. I lived with my significant other and two indoor cats, but she was out of state traveling for business. I woke up in the middle of the night. I wasn't sure of the time, but it was completely dark because my body was freezing cold. I actually like it cool when I sleep and usually have the temperature around 70 degrees or colder since I live in central Texas. But this was different. I was ice cold, but wrapped in blankets. It was the middle of the summer, so evenings aren't supposed to be cold. When I grabbed my phone to look at the time, it seemed to be off, and I pressed the on button, but it didn't turn on. Since I was half asleep, I shrugged this off. I walked out of my bedroom to go adjust the thermostat and noticed that the cats weren't around. This was weird because these fur balls are always hanging out in the bed or around the bed. Anyhow, I walked to the thermostat and tried to adjust it but the power to the thermostat I have a nest was nil and the power to the house seemed to be off I peeked out of the upstairs window to see if any of my neighbors were having power issues and noticed that all of their outdoor lights were working just fine from the time I woke to this moment was probably one to two minutes maximum I decided to wander downstairs to grab some water but was startled when I realized there was a glow of light coming from the first floor. The way my house is situated, I couldn't see the light until I had approached the stairs. I found this odd because the power seemed to be out just upstairs, which didn't make a lot of sense. I started walking down the stairs and began to hear a faint humming sound. The noise had a high pitch to it with arbitrary pulses of low sounds, almost like a muffled weed whacker that someone is throttling at random. As I continued to walk down the stairs, I spot a dark, slow-moving figure in the room, with light at the bottom of the stairs. The next step that I take feels like I walked off the side of a cliff or was sucked into the floor. That is really the best way I can explain it because I don't remember what happened after that moment. I just lost all feeling from my body. My next memory is waking up again to the sound of my phone's alarm. Everything seemed to be back to normal. I sat there in bed, cats back to being lazy in bed next to me, and tried to think about the two-minute incident that happened in the middle of the night. I'm not a sleepwalker, and I was definitely not dreaming. My security systems app shows the time whenever a door is opened or closed. I realized that the security system was disarmed on the app and that the front door had been opened and closed several times throughout the night. 
I pulled up my security footage from the exterior cameras and was surprised to learn that there was zero footage from the night. Like the motion sensors reacted to a random car driving by around 10pm and then the next thing is another random car in the morning. So someone or something walked in and out of my front door but the cameras did not capture any footage. My neighbor across the street has a good security system that points at my house so I asked if he can review the footage from his cameras. I told him some made up story about how I thought someone had broken into my truck. Anyway, he said it was weird because when he pulled up the footage from that night, his cameras did not record anything, just a time gap once again. My first thought was that I was sleepwalking and that the memory was a dream, but it just couldn't have been. When I looked out the window in the middle of the night, I distinctly recall a red pickup truck parked the wrong direction in front of the neighbor's house. I always notice when cars are parked left wheels to the curb because I've gotten a ticket for this in the past. Anyhow, the truck was not there before I went to sleep, based on footage, but was there in the morning, based on the footage as well. So the truck was there when I saw it in the middle of the night. I definitely woke up in the middle of the night, cold as ice, no cats, no working phone or thermostat, saw the truck out of the window and then got warped by something on the stairs. A couple of additional things were different in the house. The security system was disarmed and I definitely armed it before going to bed. The light was still on downstairs and that was absolutely off before I went to bed. My whole body smelled like burnt marshmallows. I know this is weird but it's really how it smelled. And lastly, my 55 gallon fish tank that sits at the bottom of the stairs in the entryway was missing two thirds of the water. Seriously. Where did 40 plus gallons of water go? The whole area around the tank was bone dry and the fish were fine. I feel like I was mind hacked by some thirsty aliens. I had a year long experience of strange events that I have never been able to explain or have a full memory of. It started in winter, working up north on a project. Our crew was put up in a motel ten minutes outside of the largest town in the area. I somehow got upgraded to a king-sized bed with couches, pretty nice room. Our days were long, so I used the couches to stack my clothes in piles, jeans, and hoodies. I had brought my entire desktop computer with me and was in the middle of a massive argument with my ex over Facebook Messenger at 1am during my second week up there. At some point, I opened my eyes and was sitting on top of a pile of hoodies on the couch. The time was now 4am. I rushed over to the computer. At some point after 1am, I had stopped typing a sentence midway through. My ex had left a ton of messages throughout the night demanding I answer her back. She also left missed calls and texts on my phone that was still sitting beside the mouse. I figured I had somehow passed out, but wasn't sure how I ended up on the top of my hoodies on the couch and not just fell back into bed. I then went to sleep normally for the remaining couple of hours before work. A couple of days later a stranger scenario happened. My routine was we'd finish work. I'd come back to the motel around 9pm, shower, change and drive into town for late night dinner at Boston Pizza, only restaurant open later other than McDonald's. So this particular night I went through my routine, took a shower, changed, headed for the door. I got to my car and when I turned it on, something felt really wrong. I looked at the time, it was now 2am. I had no idea how I had lost around 4 hours between showering and getting into my car. It felt weird, my whole body felt weird. I felt violated, like an assault victim would describe waking up from being assaulted while passed out. You feel violated but you have no idea what happened, not a single memory or explanation. I stayed up all night, scared senseless trying to figure out what happened, why I was missing 4 hours. If I had passed out, why didn't I wake up on the floor? Why did I feel violated? The rest of the project nothing else happened but once I got back home, things started happening that were just weird. For the first month or so nothing happened but then... Something weird started happening. I began waking up around 2am and not being able to fall back asleep until the sun came up. 
I would wake up and have the urge to turn on every light in the apartment and stay up, find things to do and wait until the sun came up before going back to bed. I started to notice that in my dreams, random strangers would show up telling me to wake up. If I tried to ignore them in my dream, they would find ways to harass me and tell me to wake up, telling me it's really important that I get up. Then there was a really vivid dream. I had gotten dressed up in my dream and driven to an upscale hotel. No idea what the context of this dream was. When I got to my hotel room in the dream, someone started knocking on the door, shouting, Hello, hello, over and over again. Just when I was about to open the door, the phone rang. I answered and the voice on the phone told me not to open the door. I kept telling whoever was on the phone that I really should see why this person keeps knocking, but the voice kept urging me not to answer. I finally hung up the phone, headed to the door, opened it, and woke up in bed in a cold sweat. 3 a.m. Couldn't go back to sleep. These were the kinds of dreams. People trying to get me to wake up and random flashes of bright white light that would light up everything no matter where I was or what time of day in my dream. I remember one dream being outside in the middle of a sunny day in a bright white flash that overpowered the sun, and usually at this point some random person in my dream would run up to me and urge me to wake up, or tell me the flash wasn't part of my dream and I should wake up. Random people in your dream telling you you're in a dream and that you have to wake up is incredibly creepy, and they were always strangers no one I knew in real life. A precursor to these dreams was the urge to go to sleep early. I would have these urges to drop everything that I was doing and get in bed, sometimes leaving lights on, TV on, in the middle of games, in the middle of eating. There was no fighting it. I would put down the controller or put my fork down and march right to my room and lie down. It was this weird zombie-like drowsiness. But I would always wake up after 2 a.m. and not be able to go to sleep again until the sun came up. During the summer, I took a trip to upstate New York with a friend and we stayed at some motel overnight before heading further on our trip. That night I remember knocking on my door and someone who kept yelling, Hello, hello, just like in that hotel dream. I remember my friend was fast asleep, unfazed by the knock, but I ended up going to the door and unlocking it. I don't remember anything after that. I woke up sitting on my office chair by the desk around 6 a.m. I checked, but the door was locked and nothing had been taken. It didn't look like anyone had entered. I woke my friend up and asked if he'd heard knocking during the night. He said no. I told him what happened and he was pretty angry that I would wake up in the middle of the night to open the door to a stranger, but there was no sign that I did or that someone had come in just that I somehow ended up on that chair and not on the bed. I still feel like I was awake when I went to answer the door though. The weird thing was is that these dreams and urges to go to sleep wouldn't always happen, maybe two to three times a week, but I was starting to fear going to sleep without the lights being on, all blinds closed, or I'd fight to stay up all night and just go to sleep during the day. After this I was getting really fed up with how messed up my sleep schedule had become and I started to notice that when I get the feeling that I should go to sleep, I would take that as a cue to get in my car and head for the busiest section of the city at night I could find, filled with people, and I noticed that the urge to go to sleep would go away instantly. So every time I felt the urge to drop everything to go to sleep, I would fight the urge and drive downtown. Anytime I felt like I was being watched too, I'd get in my car and go downtown. I messed up work because after a few weeks of doing all of this, all these strange urges to go to sleep randomly, dreams with flashes of white light and people telling me to wake up all went away. I haven't had a single recurrence of these events since, however I notice I still have a fear of going to sleep until the sun comes up that I'm always fighting. I also recently noticed that pictures of the typical grey alien now scare the life out of me and I hate looking at them. Even seeing the cartoon ones on South Park, I get many panic attacks. Those pictures have never bothered me before in my life, but now they send me into waves of panic. I still have no explanation for the missing time up north, the weird dreams, or that one night at the motel in upstate New York, which I don't think was a dream. It felt very real and 
felt more like another missing time event. Most people I've told don't know what to make of it. My current girlfriend has noticed I obsess with making sure all blinds are closed with no open slivers no matter where I sleep. I told this story to someone at a party once and the guy came out and told me his abduction story and he was pretty positive that I had been getting abducted during that year and that they'd either gotten bored of me or I'd become a hassle with constantly trying to drive to places full of people to avoid the happenings. Other friends either offered no explanation or believed some sort of abduction scenario was taking place. Who knows? I have no memory of physically being abducted, but those weird feelings of being watched, being urged to go to sleep, feeling violated when waking up, that felt real and still bothers me. My junior year in college, I had a strange experience. First, a few background details. My dorm room was attached to my roommate so that I had to go out hers to get to the bathroom or the hallway. She was a light sleeper, but I wasn't the type to be out late so it didn't matter. I had two normal operations in my life at that time and discovered that while under anesthesia, I would wake up briefly toward the end before I was supposed to. If I got a mosquito bite, I got to deal with it for at least a month, I'm not a fast healer. One night I had the most vivid dream of my life. I woke up briefly somewhere else and then I went right back to sleep. In this dream I looked left, I looked right, and then I passed back out, just like if I was in surgery. I was on a hospital gurney, slightly inclined, facing the wall. There was an ambient noise behind me and the echoes suggested it was a very large room, there was nothing sinister about the noises. On either side of me was a row of empty hospital gurneys. At my feet, just to my right, two people were having a conversation sitting on a bench against the wall. One was a person in a dark suit. The other was... I don't know what it was. It was small, and I saw its hands, which appeared to have darker skin, grayish. They were speaking together so animated and excited like two old friends who hadn't seen each other in years and they didn't notice me wake up. I didn't recognize the dialogue. Though I don't speak German, Mandarin, Russian, etc., I can recognize them when I hear them. This language was wholly unrecognizable, yet the person in the suit was fluent. I went back to sleep. In the morning I said to myself that that was a messed up dream and went to the shower. As I passed my roommate who was still in bed, she asked, Where did you go last night? I thought that was odd. After my shower, I started to put my makeup on and noticed something on my face. I leaned closer and could not believe what I saw. Two perfectly parallel lines, impossibly thin, impossibly perfect. There was some clear hard gel on the top and that's what I felt. There was no blood. My own hair was thicker than the width of the cuts, yet I could see down into my skin a little ways. This was 1996. I had never seen anything like this. These days I would say it was a laser cut topped with liquid band-aid, but neither of those things seemed to be prevalent in those days. I said, okay, there's an explanation. I slept on a staple or a paperclip. I do homework in my bed all the time. I went and scoured my pillow for anything sharp and I found nothing. So I got my sewing needle, a staple from some homework, and a paper clip. I dunked them in hydrogen peroxide and made cuts on my face similar to what was there. Immediately, blood welled up and the skin was jagged from all three objects, and the width of all cuts were thicker than the laser cuts. I determined that nothing in my room could have made the cuts. I didn't have an exacto knife, but I knew the blood would well up the same way if I did. I skipped my first class as I tried to figure out what to do. I kept obsessively feeling my face all day, in awe of the perfection of what was there and how it could have come to be there. There were only two people on campus rich enough to have a digital camera, which meant I would have to borrow a friend's 35mm because I didn't have my own. That meant I would have to explain myself to my friend 
and possibly the Photoshop when the pictures came back. Who would I even give the photos to? Who would I even contact and what would I tell them? In those days, if you even said the word alien, you were a pariah. After hours of mental debates sitting on the edge of my bed, I gave up thinking about it and finished my classes for the day. I sat on the edge of my bed into the night, debating, unsure of what to do. In the wee hours of the morning, I woke up. The cuts were gone, completely healed, no trace of even a scar. I was disturbed for a few days, but then I eventually forgot about it. A few years after graduating, I decided I was going to have some dental work done, and I went to two different offices to get quotes. They both took a full facial x-ray. I had long since forgotten my crazy dream and the cuts, until I sat down across from the first x-ray technician and pointed to a strange thing showing up above my teeth. I asked if I was looking at a mirror image because it was on the same side as my cuts had been, rather than the opposite side. No, I was told the x-ray was an actual, not a mirror image, so the right side of the image corresponded with the right side of my face. I pointed to the almost square image above my teeth and asked what that was. It's just an x-ray anomaly. He didn't seem bothered by it. I figured that meant that there were some damage or irregularity with the x-ray plates and let it go. Then I went to the second dentist, an orthodontist, and had another x-ray done. You guessed it, the square was there in the exact same place. This time I didn't even try to make polite small talk or beat around the bush. I pointed to the square and said, what is that? This time the tech looked at me funny and said, it's an x-ray anomaly. And she leaned closer and whispered, we see them all the time. In a way that gave me goosebumps. This was in Spokane, Washington. I didn't know what else to say, so I said nothing. Could it be that whatever negatives or plates or whatever they use for an x-ray were damaged in exactly the same spots and exactly the same shape? Maybe, I guess. I don't know much about x-rays. But after that, I reflected on my situation. I don't feel freaked out, but I think there might be something in my face put there by somebody else. Here's what I know. We do this all the time to other species. We chase them in helicopters, shoot at them with tranquilizer darts, take rectal temperatures, take blood samples, stamp radio tags in their ears with no regard to if it hurts or the trauma of the event, or if their furry buddies will ostracize them later because they have something funky on their ear. In my situation, I was clearly well cared for, if it really happened at all. Someone was there as some kind of representative on my behalf. I was handled in such a way that if I didn't have a weird metabolism, I wouldn't have known what even happened. I never once felt pain. My cut healed instantly. If this is some kind of research-driven radio tag for the purposes of data collection, preservation of habitat or species, like we would do, they did it with far more regard for me than we have for other species on our own planet. I don't know what might happen if I get another x-ray 20 years later. I have tried to look when I go through airport security if anything shows up on the image we see in the booth, but I don't see anything. Surprisingly, I'm okay with this. I think it might just be science and nothing nefarious or evil. I wish my consent to be asked first, but I suppose it's hard to ask for consent when you're not even supposed to exist. When I was a child in Collinsville, Mississippi, I used to see lights. I lived out in the country on a farm in Washington State, out near Beacon Rock. I remember one night looking out at the pasture from the front porch. I thought I was looking at the full moon, but it kept getting bigger and was moving left to right over the tree line. I turned around to go get my big brother and when we came back, it was gone. He thought I was messing with him and punched me in the arm. That next week, I went out to camp in the woods. We lived on a few hundred acres and were surrounded by woods. I would just walk for about an hour or so with my walker coonhound and Australian shepherd until we found a decent spot. I had a 22 long rifle with me usually or a 20 gauge. 
We had settled on a beautiful clearing by a small creek and set up camp. I remember it starting to get dark and starting a fire. The dog started acting strange and getting loud. My walker starts baying loudly. Next thing I know, I'm in my tent and it's super early. The tent is halfway open. The birds haven't even started up yet. The fire is completely out and my walker is gone. My Australian shepherd is outside of my tent whining. I had this really bad feeling and knew something wasn't right. I got up and puked next to the tent. I still had all my clothes on, but my boots were on the wrong feet. I took them off to correct it and noticed my socks were wet. I became terrified. This was a new feeling in the woods for me. I was about 11 years old and had been in the woods most of my life. I had never had a feeling like this before. I grabbed my 22 and took off, leaving the tent and everything else I had brought. I sprinted home through the woods and was absolutely relieved when I broke through the pasture. That dog and I never stopped running. When I got home, my mom was waiting for me and snatched me up. She was crying and said my dad and brothers were out looking for me. She told me Buddy, my walker, had come home at around 11pm that night and was baying. That dog never left my side since I got him as a pup, so they knew something wasn't right. She went out to our old red suburban and started laying on the horn to signal my dad that I had made it home. Cell phones wouldn't become a thing for another 7 to 8 years. I told her what had happened and she kind of shook it off. Nobody really thought anything about it. A few days later I had just gotten out of the shower. I had this weird habit of chewing my toenails. I wouldn't embarrass myself publicly like this if it wasn't important to the story. I was going to town on my right foot and noticed two little punctures on my right ankle. It almost looked like a snake bite. It was small and red. I instantly thought about that night in the woods and that missing time. Nothing else about it was strange. It matched an identical set on my left foot, exact same location. The first ones had showed up when I was five or six. My mom had found me outside by the mailbox sleepwalking one night at around 10 p.m. No one was ever sure how I snuck out of the house. My father would tell me this story repeatedly with such a straight look on his face I never knew if it was a myth. But when I asked my grandmother about it she says she remembers it clear as day as well. My grandmother was just known as mother back then having three children, one being my future father. They were living out in the middle of nowhere, Michigan, lost in the trees and tranquility. Preparing for a weekend without kids, my grandfather was dropping the kids off with relatives. When he returned, the house was dark, that creepy dark where everything feels eerie and you feel alone. They had a fine evening despite his ill-minded thoughts, and they didn't have any problems falling asleep. They didn't have any trouble waking up either as they were woken up by bright flashes through the tiny solo window in their room. They quickly made their way to the kitchen where they opened the back door to see what was causing the bright light. My grandfather, wanting to be brave, told his wife to step back. As he opened the back door and more bright colors appeared, an array of colors neatly set in a weird shaped circle, floating just right above the ground. As his eyes adjusted to the odd, inhumanely bright colors flashing abruptly, he noticed they were coming from some sort of mishap in aircraft, almost shaped like a football. It was just a little more round, but still resembling the bare shape of a deformed football. He couldn't tell what color the material was made out of due to the bright flashing color coming from the odd craft. It was just small enough to fit in between the patch of trees, and large enough a family could easily fit inside. He noticed something walking towards him on two legs and feet, just like a human. It seemed to be nude, and it didn't seem to have genitalia from what he saw, but everything else was very human-like. The head was an elongated, eyes bulge, but could probably pass as a deformed human. The creature walked up to him and brought his hand out like a wave, but instead of moving back and forth making a wave motion, his hand was still as if waiting for a high five. 
Not knowing what to do, my grandfather stood still until he noticed my grandmother had joined him outside and was witnessing this as well. Seeing her face made him realize that they weren't dreaming. Once the strange human-like creature put its hand down, another one of their kind appeared, walking out onto the same platform his accomplice was standing on that protruded out of the aircraft. He was holding what seemed to be some sort of flat substance. The original creature took it and began offering it to my grandparents. Nervously, my grandfather reached out for it, but the creature retracted and reached out to my grandmother instead. She looked at her husband, wary if she should accept their mystery gift, but finally did. It seemed to be squishy and round, like a pancake, but larger. The creature brought out another pancake substance for themselves and began eating it. They looked at my grandparents, waiting for them to eat as well. Without thinking, each tore a piece off of it and ate it, realizing it must have been made out of some type of wheat or grain, but not one they've seen here on earth. It was a different odd grain from wherever those creatures were from. After they saw my grandparents try their pancake, they gave another still wave and retreated into their craft. The platform disappeared with them, and the flashing colors started to fade into the sky. I always asked them, what did you do with the pancake? Did you give it to the government? Did you report it at all? Both my grandfather and grandmother said that back then, it would have been hard to report something like that, without everyone thinking they were crazy. To clarify, I didn't think I was abducted, but my friend did. I was about 15. Every night a guy I'll call Jay and I would sneak out at about midnight and go back home at around 4 to 5 in the morning before our parents would wake up for work. On one particular night we had just snuck out and it was about 1am. We headed to my backyard, laid on the trampoline and stared at the stars and talked like we always did. Now if you're in a room right now and you look around, you'll see the defined four corners where your ceiling and walls meet. You can see how square each turn is. Edge of wall, sharp turn, second wall, same with your ceiling. You can see each individual flat surface. The sky did that. It went from looking like normal stars to looking like a cube of sky. From the southeast corner of the sky came this giant UFO. I mean huge as if it took up a quarter of the entire sky. We both stared at it in dead silence. It didn't make any noise, even as it moved, and, and while it spun, it was only hovering straight. The spinning didn't move like you imagine a frisbee doing. The sides just turned while it moved. My guess what it looked like doesn't matter, but Jay and I had our eyes dead set on it. We didn't say a word. We didn't point to show the other person. As it began coming towards us, we both flipped over. Again, no hints, no talking, no eye contact. In total sync, we flipped onto our stomachs and stayed as flat and quiet as we could. Now, ducking from something sounds totally normal, an instinct, but that's not what this was. It was literally almost like telepathy. I can remember us having a mental conversation of, stay flat and it won't see us. Don't move. We watch it make a weird angled C shape across the sky, and although it felt totally in slow motion, it could have only been a few minutes because I think both of us held our breath the entire time. Not for the weirdest part. As soon as it was out of sight, boom, daybreak. We had literally just gotten to the yard, and I know it was 1.15am because I checked. But the minute we felt released from laying flat, it was very bright, like 7.30 to 8 a.m. bright. I don't remember talking to him at all afterwards other than making eye contact and then making a break for our homes before our parents noticed we weren't there. A few weeks later, even months maybe, I'm talking to my brother's girlfriend about what happened. Apparently she's real into that stuff but also completely terrified. She said the fact that it felt like a few minutes but when it suddenly was six or seven hours later, 100% makes her think that we were abducted. She was serious. I made a joke about how I should go to hypnotherapy to unblock the memories and 
she deadpans and says, Don't. People who were abducted are traumatized by what happened to them. They even get PTSD. I was camping in a campground in North Georgia with some friends. It was starting to downpour, so everyone left their tents in the woods and decided to rent one of the on-site cabins for everyone to sleep in. I decided I'd just sleep in my car because they wanted to stay up late and I was tired from kayaking all day. I woke up to the rain stopping. It was kind of cold in the car and I had forgotten my sleeping bag in my tent. I checked the cabin to see if there was any room left. The light was on and everyone was fast asleep at about 3 a.m. I didn't want to squeeze in so I decided to trek my way to my tent in the dark with a small pen light. In order to get my tent, I had to pass by everyone else's to my left. Mine was the last one and was at least 50 feet from the previous tent before it. I got in my tent, covered up with my sleeping bag and prepared to catch the last few hours of sleep before sunrise. No more than 10 to 15 minutes from me getting in my tent, I began to hear light whispers from right outside the tent door. They weren't in English and, to my recollection, indecipherable not any language that I had heard at all. Just as the voices started, two orbs appeared together outside the tent. They weren't the same glare as a flashlight would make, and both were of two different colors that, to the best of my memory, had no real distinct color, just colorful. The whispers outside the tent began arguing louder between each other, but still in a hushed tone, and as the whispers grew louder, the lights began swirling around the tent behind me, to the side and to the front. It wasn't any movement that one could make with flashlights and at this point I realized no footsteps could be heard. I uncovered myself and knelt on the tent floor preparing for the zipper to come undone like in a horror movie and I was flipping through my mind on what option to take. I was the most terrified that I've ever been, fight or flight. The lights swirled faster and the voices grew louder but still breathy and whispery. My mind raced and I was sweating despite the cold. And then, just like that, the light shut off like a switch. And the whispers stopped and nothing was left but the silence of an empty woods. I stood there as still as I could and didn't dare go outside that tent till the sun came up. It was and still is the scariest moment of my life. I hope this makes sense. I have never written it out before. If I need to answer anything, I can try in between moments at work. Interestingly enough, I went to a horror movie premiere recently, Beacon Point, and there was a scene that had the same voices in it and goosebumps ran up my arms. It was identical to what I heard that night in my tent. First, I want to say that this may or may not be a humanoid encounter. I may just be having dreams, but if it's the case, I've never had a dream so absolutely lucid or realistic. In my dreams, I'm almost always compelled in my actions, but in this recurring situation, I am in full control and can feel and smell everything. So, this first came about sometime when I was about 11 or 12 years old, which puts us around 2009 or 2010. I can't really remember which... I just know it was this point when I frequently stayed with my great-grandma shortly before my great-granddad died of cancer. It is in northwest Georgia, in Chattanooga County, pretty rural by most standards, just a couple thousand people around. Anyways, I had been staying with my great-grandparents then in their rather large house in a very rural neighborhood of about four houses, all sparsely spread at the end of the road, somewhat near a nice lake and park. At some time around 1 a.m., I decided to get up from my bed, walk down the long hall to the living room, and get myself a glass of water from the kitchen that basically connects directly to the living room. I walked down the hall as normal, but when I approached the doorless entry to the living room, I instantly felt like something was wrong. It felt like time itself had slowed down, and the moonlight that shined into the living room from our large side windows didn't quite look right. I then understood what was so amiss to me. The lights in the living room were on, but in a way, not so. 
There was a yellowish light like someone had cut the lights on as normal, but it wasn't the same as what I had always grown up with. It was slightly off. Anyways, I walked a few steps around the corner, thinking I had figured out what was bothering me so much. Well, it was wrong. I turned the corner, and in the midpoint of the room, about six or seven feet from me, was a tall figure in an obscure cloak. To the left and right of him were two much smaller figures, but they seemed to disappear as soon as I focused any attention to them. I can't even be sure what they look like. The smaller ones were the classic grey alien shape that I now am aware of, but whenever I tried to glance to them, they just sort of faded to an indescribable there but not there shape. The best way I can describe it is if a shape became the static you would see on a television screen, or if they had been drawings, they would have been hastily scribbled in. My eyes darted from the tall figure to them, at which point they sort of disappeared, and then back to the tall figure. This was all I could do before the tall one was alerted, seemingly by them disappearing. The tall one was somehow much more unnerving than the other two. When I looked at him from behind, he was incredibly tall, reaching the ceiling. He had to hunch over a small bit in order to not hit his head. That was the strangest thing, though. When viewed from behind, his black cloak only extended up the height of a very tall person and ended, but when he turned around, he was even taller. It was like his head was totally invisible from behind. Now the tall one is the biggest thing about this whole story. He turns around and it's like everything around me just warped. Remember when I said earlier that everything felt wrong or out of place in this general area? It got intensified by several orders of magnitude as soon as he turned around, somehow seemed to gain several feet in height and look at me. He seemed very surprised that I was there. Sound seemed to completely fade away, but I remember exactly what he smelled like. I couldn't place it then, but after spending the next several months visiting my great granddad in the hospital and then going to his funeral, I can affirm that it was the smell of death the kind of smell that you only find in places with people dying. It's very particular. Not a horrible stench, but you can feel its morbidity. It's like it thickens the air. The moment he turned around and looked at me, two things happened. First, I became instantly paralyzed. I couldn't move, couldn't scream. I could only stand. I didn't feel like I was there, and I couldn't help but think that I shouldn't be there. I had an instant overwhelming feeling that I shouldn't be there at that exact moment in time, that exact place. Uh, secondly, I saw his face. It was very much like what would be considered the standard grey alien face, although incredibly white. Not a bright white, but an unnaturally white form of white, just dulled a bit. Blemish-free, no hair, no variance in coloration had a large conish head, small mouth, small nose holes, etc., but his almond-shaped eyes were absolutely horrifying. I don't think I've ever seen anything remotely as disturbing. They look like they didn't belong in this place of existence, like a two-dimensional or four-dimensional object existing in a three-dimensional world. I could only see his face, the rest of what I could assume to be his body still underneath his black cloak. The worst thing came next. He seemed to just look at me in some form of panicked curiosity for a moment or two, with me still paralyzed, literally in fear. Then he produced a long arm from the side of his cloak, with thin, elongated fingers. He bent his body towards me as though one would bend over to pick up something, but bent forward towards me. His mouth seemed to expand and possibly wide for his head. His hand creeped closer to me, and right as he touched my face... I lost consciousness and woke up the next morning. The scariest part of the whole ordeal was what I felt like when he saw me. I was sure he was going to kill me, but not in a way you would expect, like getting stabbed or shot. When he saw me, I felt like every part of me would be absolutely annihilated. I'm an atheist and was at the time, but it felt like for that one brief moment I had a soul and he was going to steal it from me. It's such an immense feeling of dread, thinking that even more than your very life is about to become nothing. When I woke up, everything was not as it was when I had went to sleep or when I had woken up originally to get water. 
This is what scares me most to this day, confirming to me that this was not a simple dream. While I had originally went to sleep in my bed in a room down the hall from the living room, I woke up in an obscure position on the living room couch. It was early in the morning, probably 6 or 7 a.m., judging from the light outside, so I went back into my bedroom and crawled into bed. It was only after I made it into my bedroom that I remembered what had just happened to me. I became absolutely mortified, covered myself under a blanket, and waited until I heard the sounds of my great-grandma cooking bacon in the kitchen. That was when I came out of my room and went back to the living room. Fast forward about two years later, my great-granddad has passed away, I'm a bit older, and I kept having dreams about the tall one that I saw that one night. I had these dreams somewhat often and every time. I woke up in a cold sweat, usually unable to sleep for the rest of the night. The dreams were most frequent shortly after the first encounter, and every night for four nights in a row before the second, which I now detail. The second time I saw him, it played out much like the very first. I got out of bed sometime at around 2 to 3 a.m. and went to the kitchen to get a Dr. Pepper this time instead of water. Around three-fourths of the way down the hall, I remember what happened that night, and I instantly froze. I could feel them close again. I could feel the aura of wrongness that I had originally felt right before the first time I saw them. I tried to turn around and sneak back to my room, or my great-grandma's, or my grandparents who had come to live with us after the death of my great-granddad. I couldn't turn around, though. I felt absolutely compelled to continue into the living room. It was like I didn't have a choice, but I suddenly felt very okay with the idea, like I was calm despite what I knew was going to happen to me. Sure enough, in the living room was the tall one, but he was already facing the entrance to the living room where I was walking from, and he was unaccompanied this time. He also didn't smell this time. There was no stench, but I could hear a faint humming that sounded like it was coming from outside. We lived near a highway, so it could have been a car, but it didn't sound like one. He knew I was there, and I'm pretty sure he was the one that calmed me and forced me to come into the living room. He seemed much more approachable this time, but he did the exact same as before. He studied me for a moment with a small smile and then put me to sleep with his hand. Again, I woke up on the couch. When I woke up, I felt less horrified about what happened and more curious as to why, and I remember distinctly feeling like I was trapped by fate into seeing him multiple times, like I was sure it would happen again, whether I wanted it to or not. Throughout the years, I never distinctly remembered meeting him again, but he did appear in my dreams. I moved twice, and he was still there every four to six months. Sometimes it was a singular appearance in my dreams. Other times it was up to three nights in a row. On the fourth night after I had the third dream, I stayed up at night sitting in the living room of my new house, waiting to see him. But I never did. Instead, I woke up still in the living room, but upside down against my couch, and my legs up in the air, my upper back on the floor, and my lower back resting on the edge of the couch cushion. Several blankets were haphazardly spread around me. I guess he knocked me out before I was able to see him, and he did whatever he does. In all this time, I still have no idea what he actually was doing or why it was me. I still am very, very unnerved every time he was in my dreams, but I was less surprised. So, that ends the tale for now. I sort of await my next encounter as the hooded one in the dream did tell me we would meet again. In 1997, three of my friends and I were driving down a long winding route to my house at around 10 p.m. I was in the back seat. It was very cold. February or early March in New Hampshire. Suddenly, my friend driving says, What? My friend in the passenger seat starts saying, Oh my god, oh my god. The two of us in the back seat are craning our necks trying to see, and then directly in front of the car, a bright light dilates, then gets smaller. The car is at a crawl now, and we are all looking up astonished at four to five other lights dilating and receding. 
They grow to about the size and brightness of a police searchlight, but then get so small that they disappear. This part is going to sound insane, but we were all there, and we all saw the same thing. We pulled over on a shared driveway that has a good view because it's on a snowy hill overlooking a reservoir. The reservoir is frozen solid with enough ice to ride a truck on, for all of you swamp gas naysayers. But now that there is somebody else around, just the four of us in the freezing cold, we get out of the car and look up, hoping to see the lights. We saw lights alright, but they were acting very differently. High above us were large elongated lights shaped like lozenges. They were about a dozen of these and they just kind of hung in the air, milling about slowly in various directions. These occasionally got brighter and dimmer, and what really freaked us out were the smaller lights, the size of bright stars, which exited from the sides of the larger lozenges. These would emerge four or six at a time and then they would start moving quickly back and forth and side to side, very quickly and changing directions instantly. Then they would start squiggling about very erratically before stopping, moving along or in tandem with others before retreating to the lozenges. Meanwhile, others were emerging from other lozenges, so there was a constant busy display of these little ships zooming about, almost as though they were dancing with each other. It was insane, and thinking about it now, it is so vivid in my mind that it seems like yesterday. We stayed outside for an hour before we couldn't take the cold anymore. My friends dropped me off at the bottom of my half mile long driveway so as not to get stuck on the ice. My driveway was poorly maintained and I was embarrassed to have friends at my house anyway because my dad was an alcoholic and we lived off the grid. After they pulled away, I looked up but saw nothing. No signs of any UFOs but there were trees here so I couldn't see as well. Then I had a sudden twinge of panic. It was a deep panic, overwhelmingly horrified but also still in shock about what we had seen. I was suddenly afraid to be out there alone. I ran up the driveway, not thinking about ice, and snuck to my room where I probably didn't even sleep, not that I recall. We have all spoken of this since. For the first few days we were all still in awe, but we never really seemed to be telling anyone else at school about it, at least I didn't. I don't know how the others were dealing with it. We slowly stopped talking about it. About seven or eight years later, I met up with a couple of them and I asked if they remembered. I was afraid I had made the whole thing up and that it was a dream or maybe I was going crazy or had been crazy at the time. They both remembered in the same detail as I did, although we were all a little embarrassed to discuss it again. I was about 8 or 9 and my mom tells me we were going on a day trip to meet her high school friend. Cool. I grabbed my Game Boy Advance because I know my mom's friend has kids my age and wanted to show them up in this racing game I had. I overheard this from my mom talking with her friend at her house. They told me to leave the room because they needed to talk about adult things. Little innocent curious me wonders what exactly are adult things that I can't hear. Were they going to throw some new juicy cuss words out? Well, my mom's friend had a little girl who would sleepwalk at night. Started when they moved into their new house, North California. It was a suburban area, but not too suburban. New neighborhood with a lot of empty homes and forest patches in between each community. She was about four years old, and they found her one night in the backyard just sitting there. After that incident, they decided they needed to lock her in her room at night and bar up her windows so that she doesn't end up in the woods nearby or anywhere besides her room, really. So one night, my mom's friend and husband wake up to a loud boom on the side of the house in the middle of the night. It felt like something hit the house because everything shook. They check on their boys. They're good. The boys didn't hear anything and go back to sleep. They check on their daughter unlock the door and realize she isn't in her room. They start to freak out, then hear a knock at the door. They open it. It's the effing sleepwalking four-year-old daughter. 
They ask her where she's been, and she said with the men, and points down the street. The angry dad sees two guys in coats walking down the street. He yells at them and starts sprinting. Mom's friend said the coat guys didn't react at all. Coat guys turn the corner, dad turns the corner, and they're gone. Mom and dad check the locks and windows. No tampering. They notify the police who pretty much say there's not much they can do, but will keep an eye out. The sleepwalking four-year-old daughter is fine, isn't scared at all. She's just tired and goes back to bed. I wouldn't say that I was abducted by aliens specifically, but I was definitely taken somewhere. It was more of an abduction of consciousness, if that makes sense. I don't know, it might have been my body too, it was a weird feeling I can't really explain. I was sitting at the park one day in broad daylight with four or five friends. I lived in a small community in the Midwest, so the park was empty except for us. We were talking and smoking, when suddenly everyone just kind of slowed down and eventually froze completely, myself included. I couldn't move or talk. I couldn't blink. I had to focus really hard on just breathing and then I blacked out. I woke up alone in a dark, nearly pitch black room with three large illuminated screens around me. On the screens I saw the park from above, the exact spot where my friends and I were sitting. It felt like I was in that room for hours until I blacked out again. I finally came to and realized that I had been crying hysterically on the ground. The rest of my friends seemed pretty wrecked too, like they all just experienced something equally terrifying. I was the first one of us to speak. I said, I think I met God. And they all responded with similar brief statements. I remember one girl saying, we're on TV somewhere, which explained the feeling of being watched, unsafe, and violated really well. I can't remember what anyone else said, just the general idea of, we just got taken somewhere. We didn't talk about it besides one weird short sentence each. That was the strangest part for me. That we didn't talk about it, but we all understood that we'd seen the same thing. It felt like we couldn't talk about it where it or they could see us. We left immediately and haven't spoken about it since. I don't keep in touch with those friends anymore, but it would be interesting to know if they felt like it was an abduction of some kind too. The abductions started when I was really young. They were not scary experiences, but more like odd dreams. Every night I would sneak down to our living room, which had a large window. I would face the window and say, Ha woo. After that, a large wolf head would materialize and say, Ha woo, back to me, and my next memory would be waking up. I was never caught getting out of bed or going down the stairs, but I do remember that occasionally there would be leaves or dirt on the living room floor that my parents had no clue where it came from. We moved into a suburbs, and that changed the nature of the experience. I don't remember being afraid when I lived in the country, but once I lived in the suburbs, I was terrified of going to sleep. My first memory of an abduction experience was caused by a doctor's visit. Someone I went to school with got sick with something and everyone who had contact had to get a shot. I had never had a shot before, but when the nurse approached me with the needle, I lost my mind. I was probably 9 or 10, but it took three nurses and poor old Dr. Lee, my pediatrician, to hold me down. I remember telling them to get that thing away from me and getting images of shadowy figures and flashes of pain in my eyes. After that, I was always awake when they came. I'd wake up and they'd be next to my bed or looking in the window, but they never tried to hide their intentions after that. The abductions peaked around 13 or 14 with about one every two months. By that time, I had adjusted my life to try to deal with it, going to sleep as soon as I got home from school and waking up at around midnight and staying awake until I went to school, hoping it didn't happen. It might have worked, but it didn't help with school and family life. Slowly, the incidents became less frequent and maybe once a year. 
My last abduction was on my 27th birthday. I was fully conscious, and I had just gotten done calling into work saying that I would not be coming in that night. I walked outside of my car and looked up and saw something moving through the sky. It was black and amorphous and kept changing shape. At one point I thought it looked like the space shuttle, but then it started heading towards me. I got in my car and tried starting it, but it didn't turn over. Right after that, I got this buzzing ringing in my head that was jarring and painful. By then, the craft was right over top of me, and ahead of my car, one of the creatures just materialized and moved towards me. My car door just kind of opened on its own, and it touched me with this rod thing it was carrying, and I blacked out. I came to an hour later and immediately went to work, even though I called off. I haven't had any experiences since, but I still live the way I did when it was happening. I can't sleep at night, so I work at night and sleep during the day. Relationships were difficult to maintain, but I'm doing much better now. I have some suspicion that my parents were slightly aware that something was going on when I was younger. I've had several experiences of waking up some distance away from where I was previously or sleeping at. Twice, I was wearing clothes that were not mine. This isn't my first encounter with those beings. I've had a few encounters with them so far and it only left me confused and freaked out. My parents decided it was a good idea to send me off on a small vacation with my grandparents to Turkey. They thought it was a great idea to have me relax after such a stressful year. I went to a doctor after my first experience thanks to my parents who only sent me to a therapist to see if something was wrong with me. So far, no one believes me for what I've seen, but that doesn't stop me from believing it. My grandparents have this small house in the village. The next neighbor is several kilometers away, which makes it almost impossible to visit someone else. However, there are barely any trees. It's always very hot around June, and sleeping at night is way more difficult than anyone thinks. My grandparents were already sleeping, and since there was nothing to watch on television, I decided to call an end to the day and sleep outside. Of course, I didn't actually go camping, but used the balcony instead, as I did not want to wake up with a snake around me. I grabbed some pillows and a few blankets after I turned the lights on. Sleeping in the dark isn't really something I enjoy a lot, not after the many experiences I've had. The light was more for my own comfort than anything else. But I already could feel something was off. It was suddenly colder outside than it was a minute ago, and this awful feeling of being watched started to make me feel paranoid. I quickly looked back inside, but I saw nothing and shrugged it off thinking I was making myself paranoid. That was, at least, what I had really thought. Once my eyes traveled down to the garden, I saw something way too familiar. It was dark outside, but my eyes never betrayed me for what I've seen and the light I had. Below me stood a tall gray. It was very tall and skinny. I'm not really sure how tall, but definitely taller than an average human. Its shoulders were very thin and the arms reached its knees. But to make it a bit clearer, it literally looked like those toys that you could stretch their limbs. All it did was stare at me as I stared back at it. I'm not sure how long this lasted, but I blinked my eyes and the creature was all of a sudden a bit closer than it was before. That's when I knew that it knew I was there. I was frozen in fear and the alien moved its head a bit to the side only to move it back straight, as if it was curious to see me, and after a bit, I finally got the courage to do something. Instead of freaking out like always, I thought it was a better idea to react calmly. The first thing I did was wave my hand slowly at it, and only to have it give the same response back after a few minutes. I did as much as I could trying not to freak out, but I only became even more scared. I asked what it was doing here, but... That was when I felt my whole body becoming stiff. My mind was telling me to scream for help, someone to come and get this creature away. I knew one thing for sure. It wanted something from me. Something I had no idea of what it could be. I asked the creature again why it was here and only got a reaction by moving its head a bit to the side again. The alien moved a bit closer, standing right underneath me. 
looking up at me with those big black eyes. I wasn't able to see a mouth before, but now I could. I was shaking in fear, not knowing why it was standing this close. A loud voice of a man called for me, asking what I was doing on the balcony in the middle of the night. My eyes quickly moved to the police officer of the village who was always driving around at night. However, once my eyes met the officers, I quickly looked back down, only to see that the alien had disappeared. The officer saw how alarmed I was, as it was easy to see that I was shaking and nearly at the point of falling to my knees. All I did was say that something was in the garden, and that's when the officer quickly entered the garden to check if someone was there. However, he told me he saw nothing and called a few other officers to check the surrounding area. My grandparents were woken up by the officer and told them what happened. However, my grandfather, who has a bit of an obsession with aliens, asked me many questions about the alien I've seen. It seemed like it isn't the first time this has happened at all, and that it has been common in our family for encounters like this. He didn't tell me much. But what I did learn was that my grandfather was, or still is, an abductee. This happened to me during my junior year of high school. I'm in my second year of college now. The bus to my high school departed every weekday morning at around 7.30 a.m., so I would usually leave my house at 7.15 since it was a short walk to my bus stop. This event took place during a dark morning sky. It was clear out, just the sun hadn't risen yet. I walked to the bus stop during my usual time, got there, and stood among the usual group of students who also took the bus to school every morning. I had been waiting for the bus while scrolling through my phone for about five minutes when I got tired of looking down and decided to put my phone away. I began to analyze the beautiful dark morning sky when, all of a sudden, what appeared to be a large green glowing orb that appeared to be followed by two or three smaller ones. Very quickly, they soared across the opening between the tree lines and disappeared into the horizon behind a thick tree line facing a lake. It happened very fast, made no sound, and left no trail at all. I was left confused more than startled. I know for a fact that I hadn't imagined what I had just seen. I looked around myself to see if anyone else shared my same expression, only to notice the guy standing next to me was erratically scanning the sky. He saw that I was looking at him and asked if I had just seen that. I said yes and asked him what it was, but he obviously didn't have the answer. No one else in that group of people saw it. The bus got there at that exact moment and we all got on. Fast forward to about an hour later, I got to my physics class and sat on my assigned table. I heard the girl behind me talking loudly about the weird flying thing she saw this morning. I quickly turned and asked her what the color was. She said green. I said I saw it too and she got very excited, expressing her gratitude to me for showing the other students that she wasn't crazy. Class began after that. I really don't know what was happening that morning and I don't expect you guys to have the answer either. I just wanted to share this story since it has remained in the back of my head ever since. It's not the only encounter that I've had of this sort, but it was definitely the first. I am glad that these other two people also saw what I saw because it means that it really did happen. Keep in mind that the girl in my physics class didn't live in the same community as I did, meaning that whatever this UFO was, it must have soared pretty high in the sky. I haven't seen anything quite like this since. So I've had a handful of paranormal encounters. Now that I am older, they have really stopped. This one happened when I was around 21 to 22. I'm now 30. I rented a room at my friend's house on the second story. I had a female boxer dog that would sleep with me in the room. I had one window that would face the neighborhood street. One night my dog jumped on my bed, blocking my view of the television. I tried to move her with my feet, but she wouldn't budge. She started a low growl facing my window. Since she didn't want to move, I turned off my TV and went to sleep, and she kept growling. I don't know what time it was later, but 
I woke up to a very, very bright light shooting through my blinds. I instantly became annoyed and got up to see which car had their lights on so bright that it was coming into my bedroom. Mind you, never had I experienced this level of brightness. I got up and put my fingers through the blinds to open them. Then after that, everything went blank. I remember opening my eyes and walking inside a type of room. The room was metallic, with no seams, just perfectly curved metal. In front of me was a perfect metallic bed. It was just a metal rectangle in a grey color. Behind me I could sense that there were things guiding me to this metal bed. We were communicating but not through speaking, we were kind of talking through our minds. I could tell that they were just trying to guide me to the metallic bed in the middle of the room. I remember standing right in front of the metallic bed-like thing and just like that I was back in my bedroom. I remember standing in my room but this time with my back facing my window. The next morning I woke up. I actually didn't remember any of this, this all came to me later. I woke up feeling extremely sick to my stomach, I wanted to throw up. I stumbled down the stairs because I was also extremely hungry. I got the milk out of the fridge and was getting ready to pour it into the box of cereal. I stopped myself and went over to the sink which faces the backyard. That was when I saw my dog running around the backyard, the dog who should have still been in my room. That was when it all hit me. All the memories came back. I ran up the stairs as fast as I could to look at the condition of my room and furniture was thrown around. This was around winter time so it got cold and I would sleep with three blankets. All three blankets were formed into perfect spiral type designs on my bed. I went to the spirals and destroyed them since I couldn't believe what had happened. Something changed inside me after that day. I got dumber in a sense. I had speech problems on which I would stutter after every other word. Also, I couldn't comprehend what I was reading unless I read it slowly three to four times. I knew something happened that night. It wasn't until almost a year later I was in my room just chilling in my bed. I was at the house alone since my roommate was working. Once again a bright light shot through my room but this time the house began to rumble. It literally felt like an earthquake had struck. Fear struck down my body since I already knew what that light was all about. This time the light just went away. The rumbling only lasted for about five seconds and everything was gone. After that day I regained my reading and speaking levels. It all just kind of went back to normal. Definitely one of the weirdest moments in my life. Hey friends, thanks for listening. Be sure to subscribe and click that notification bell to be alerted of all future narrations. If you got a story, be sure to submit them to my subreddit, r let's read official, and give and receive feedback from the community, and maybe even hear your story featured on the next video. And join my Discord to interact with me and other listeners directly. And if you want to support me even more, grab early access to all future narrations for just $1 a month on Patreon and maybe even pick up some Let's Read merch on Spreadshirt. All links in the bio. Thanks so much, friends, and I'll see you again soon.